Campbell. There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very, very honored, excited, and thrilled today to have a three time podcast guest. Leo Zagami in the house. Leo, what is up, my brother? How are you? Well, great uh, here to uh, offer you delucidations on my latest book. I see that you have made a change of scenario for yourself. I'm very glad to hear that you are get, doing great wherever you are. And uh, it's, yes, it's, it's basically another uh, um, installment in my confession series, which is also, I regard, uh, particularly important important because uh, a bit like my past book volume seven wants to be not only an essay but also a manual to protect yourself from uh, whatever you are viewing or listening to because at the end of uh, uh, this book when you close down this book uh, you will probably never have uh, the same uh, expectations the same views about uh, uh, things uh, regarding uh, art, uh, which is usually regarded as, as something innocent. And now you watch a movie, uh, the, the, the typical uh, person doesn't really think much about the way this movie is made or it's uh, kind of crafted to, uh, tailored to then shape your own uh, thoughts. And the same can be said also with music frequencies that are, of course, not only uh, used within music, but also used like uh, uh, you saw in my book uh, for, uh, uh, in, in a way, harassing people magnetically yeah. through yeah. now recently they just said, ah, no, uh, all these uh, electromagnetic attacks uh, made on the embassies were probably uh, not real. That doesn't seem to be a very realistic thing after there were so many reports and so many people felt sick with them. So that is also another uh, topic. But uh, the, uh, the, the work that I did is divided in uh, a number of chapters that each defines the uh, great reset of our life also in the, the in hollywood in the music industry and uh, at the same time uh, it goes through both the military industrial complex side of things as well as the geopolitical and the occult inevitably we talk once again also about the occult as people know uh, my definition of the illuminati of course includes uh, all those uh, secret societies, society with secrets like Freemasonry and mystery schools that in one way or another are pushing uh, towards uh, globalization, pushing towards also a one world religion, uh, pushing uh, towards uh, a society which uh, will gradually be more and more in the control of an artificial intelligence that will always almost be godlike. So this is uh, basically uh, what uh, the book is all about. And I'm very much uh, glad to be here with you today. And I'm glad to have you too. So, I mean, you guys, for you guys, and most of you guys know Leo, because like I said, this is his third time on the podcast. He's written eight uh, books, essentially eight volumes of Confessions of Illuminati. If you're not familiar with him, let me just give you guys his bio real quick. He is or was or is or was known for a brilliant career as Leo Young in the media and the music industry. So he has a really inner... Uh, you know, well, yes, that, that is really also a peculiarity regarding this book. Is the yeah. first book in which I go in depth into what used to be also my own participation with the 
uh, entertainment industry as a DJ, as a record producer, as somebody who also had a grandmother who used to uh, work at the actor studio, used to be a great teacher of acting, uh, an author herself, known as incoming Felicity Mason. And, uh, and so uh, from this background, I was lucky enough to uh, definitely have uh, a bird's eye view on certain things and and and, and from a very early age also be been introduced into the reality of what's really is behind the show business so yes uh, uh, please continue with your introduction so that people can know a little bit more i guess you are uh, synthetically putting together no uh, making a synthesis and yeah. uh, for those people who, of course, have not maybe followed the, the past uh, interviews, which we will recommend to watch so they can then have a full perspective. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I mean, to what you were saying, though, uh, the truth is, is that when you have a bird's eye view and you're in it, sometimes it takes you leaving it to truly look at things from the perspective of not being in it. Right. Because it's you know, it's the same thing that you talk about in the book, the energy and frequency when you're actually immersed in something is so all encompassing, especially when someone like you, who's very talented and you immerse yourself in your, you know, um, in your, in your portrayal or your actions and everything that you do as an actor, as a DJ, as a, a music producer, sometimes you have to leave. It's the same thing for anybody. You know, you get so caught up in what you do that you're not really looking at things from like, you know, behind the veil or from outside of the veil. So you do, you definitely, paint a very compelling um, image or, 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 or view because again, you were in it and now you're out of it and you can look at things from a really neutral observational point of view. And that's why I love your books uh, because again, you really were in the Illuminati. I mean, there's, you know, that's not when people say that nowadays, you know, it's like a catchy phrase, like what the hell does that mean? You know, they think of Kanye West or whatever, but like, you know, yeah, you it, really it, it, simplification of the whole thing. And yes, I was, of course, in the Illuminati of Adam Bishop, following that tradition, but also in various other secret societies, the OTO, Fraternius Rosa Cucian Antigua, Fraternius Saturni, and so on. I mean, a lot of uh, secret societies in which I mingled from a very early age because of my family background that brought me in 1993, in April 1993, to be initiated uh, in, uh, in, in this uh, Illuminati of the New World Order, in these uh, Freemasons that were connected to it, because not all Masons are knowledgeable about certain things. The majority right. are not. The majority are uh, brought to a level that conducts some simple uh, kind of social activities, right. which are more or less like a Rotary Club. <laughs> they don't uh, have... Uh, 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 often connection with what is really behind it all and the higher echelons which pilot this whole system. And yeah. I will say that it's not only Freemasonry that today is corrupt, unfortunately. Yeah. All the institutions politically, religiously are corrupt by this uh, same ideology that uh, we see so well defined within uh, the World Economic Forum. That's why in this book, uh, I also talk about the influence of the World Economic yeah. Forum, Klaus Schwab, Forum, yeah. on show business and on the cinema it's business. Unbelievable. Are you currently suffering from a testosterone deficiency? Are you already using therapeutic testosterone? If you are, go to tottdecoded.com forward slash 10 dash questions and find out the top 10 questions you need to be asking your doctor about therapeutic testosterone. These are critical questions to ask your doctor. If they can't answer them, you need to find another doctor. Yeah, so this makes you understand the really the level of uh, um, in, intrinsic level of, of, of links that are between the show business politics and often also there is another level which is kind of not really understood very well the level of influence of the military industrial complex in right. Hollywood which is also very much present so there are good conspiracy analysts and bad conspiracy analysts like I say in my book but there is they are, like, they are good and bad historians the problem is a lot of people get way too paranoid they don't have a direct experience in the matter they tend to perceive at times uh, only part of this uh, conspiracy. They don't. They don't manage to put one plus one is two. You know, link yeah. this to this to this to this. In my book, I try even in volume eight to give, as we are 
discussing once again the Illuminati, but this time in the context of entertainment, I really went in detail. This is a 700 pages yes. book. Uh, I mean, it's not just uh, well, 200, 300 pages. And in those 700 pages, I very much go into the detail of understanding this gigantic conspiracy made of several power blocks that are running or seeking to gain control of this new world order. And at times, unfortunately, there is a lot of disinformation that unfortunately leads also to cases of anti-Semitism in yeah. the case of, I, no, sorry to say case so, so many times, but it, it's true. Kanye West, in the case of anti-Semitism, I think it's the primary example of how you can be led astray to understand right. only part of the reality. And then uh, that uh, partial perception uh, brings also a lot of chaos in your own life, confusion. I mean, I'm sure that uh, Kanye West has uh, the heart in the right place when right. it comes down to his uh, wanting to expose all this, what right. he has lived partly himself also as a record producer and, of course, uh, as an important uh, artist, rapper. And, 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 so, and, and, of course, they're now also involved in, in, in the fashion business and, and, much, uh, and much, much more. But the problem here is uh, that uh, in, uh, in this context, we see that this information is rampant, uh, they talk yeah. about the Kazarians, they talk about this, they talk about the Illuminati everywhere, when in reality, uh, then uh, you have to really understand what this um, big network made up of different secret society really is. And it's complex, and it's not something you can really learn from a page on the internet and, and suddenly <laughs> think that you know it all. Uh, that is the their own presumption, Jay, that I had, uh, have often uh, when there is uh, now this situation. So uh, at times, unfortunately, entire ethnic groups uh, are accused or unfortunately, like the Jews, end up yeah. uh, linked with a conspiracy, which, which I find insulting, not because I'm partly Jew, because I'm just a minimal part Jew myself, but uh, and I'm actually born Catholic, uh, and I was raised as such. But uh, I feel sorry at times for my Jewish friends because of such attacks. And that's why yeah. when uh, I came down to study for the, the, the making of this book, I started a long time ago, and some of the best information was given to me by Jewish people working in Hollywood uh, or around Hollywood. People like Roseanne Barr, for example, yeah. who now is back on Fox, but she's for a time, back. <laughs> she's back. But for a time, she was with me doing the pew on the on YouTube. But we were doing a show; nobody was watching. Not <laughs> watching. I was Do you like, think it's really her? Or do you think they cloned her and somebody else? No, no. I I, I speak with Roseanne. I speak with Roseanne almost every week. Thank and, God. And exchange some messages. And stuff she follows my work very much in awesome. articles and, and and we stayed in contact after we collaborated for this show which was an experiment which i'm very proud of because sure. the view was an experiment that wanted to put together a jewish rabbi a christian uh, uh, anglican priest catholic whatever anglican priest then uh, then catholic liberal whatever and then we had uh, um uh, Rudolf Steiner, anthropophy, uh, yep. and then we had uh, in the same show uh, figures like Rosambar uh, that are from the show business, but are also very well worse, versed in Judaism. And she uh, teach me a lot about really nice. the roots of this uh, problem. So with them, we started uh, to, to, to analyze publicly certain things. Uh, and, and so I think it was a very interesting confrontation, very interesting, how you say, dialogue that... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wish, I uh, hope in the future we can continue. However, the book project uh, on Hollywood started uh, when I first came here in California. I was not living yet here. I, I live here now permanently since 2019. But uh, I came here in California the first time in 2014 uh, after coming to America various times, but never, I had never been in California. I wanted right. to go write a book about the Illuminati and Hollywood. I wanted to really see what was true about this. Right. Is it real? I'm myself. I've been a member of these societies. Right. I've, uh, I have the degrees. I can access to particular information sources that maybe other people can't. When I go there, I understand about symbolism. Let me go directly and see what's, what's happening. And actually, thanks to the help of another Freemason who 
uh, you, of course, uh, probably know, which is Sean Stone, the son yeah. of Oliver Stone. Uh, I managed to have uh, access to a lot uh, of uh, privileged information on what was really going on in Hollywood. He confirmed me a series of things, and I was like, oh, okay, wow. so, well, yeah. then there is some truth to it all. Let me investigate it more. And aside from helping me with publishing my first books here in the English language with my past publishing company, which I still collaborate with, which yeah. is CCCC Publishing of Brad Olson. Mm -hmm. But now we have a new publishing company that we have inaugurated in the last five years and it's going very well, which is our own course and perficio. Well, uh, the, the, the work that I did at that time, actually in 2014, uh, didn't really come out in the English language. I published a book on Hollywood and the Illuminati in 2000, I think, 14 uh, in Italy. It wasn't 14, 15 in Italy. But it was a booklet of around 200 pages, yeah. uh, 200, 250 pages. And, and it was a book uh, which was the result of my investigative work uh, during my time in California. Sure. Um, but then... I, I thought, okay, I, I will include some of these elements. And I actually, when I was doing volume two, I started to, to uh, work on some elements of my investigation in Hollywood. But it wasn't enough. Uh, volume two is already a big book. I couldn't make it a, a thousand pages book. So I left it there. I said, okay, I'm going to pick up on more maybe information later on. I will continue my investigative work later on. And only when I got here to Palm Springs in 2019, I understood that I could really have access to a lot more information to make this book, enrich this book and make it into what is now. So uh, it was a project that started almost 10 years ago, but now the results have been uh, these two books because I came out contemporary with volume eight in Italian, as you can see, uh, the Italian edition as well uh, as uh, because uh, you have Confessioni of an Illuminati, this is the Italian edition and this is the English edition. Now, it was the first, and I think it's going to be the only time I ever have <laughs> another page book in two languages because it was a headache. Oh, man. Because uh, I am very accurate with the citation sources and everything to make this book credible and also because I'm dealing with people who can sue your ass off. Oh, absolutely. So, so uh, I have over a thousand uh, citation sources uh, accurately. You can, you know, it's, it's also a book that they you can, can actually still sue you though. Eh? <laughs> they can still sue you no, if they no. want to. <laughs> you can. If you respect the rules of the what what basically is, uh, yeah. The, um, as a journalist and as a writer, you of course know what are the rules of the game, yes, and especially course. here in America. Uh, for, fortunately, we still have the First Amendment. We still have uh, a society which is attempting to uh, resist uh, the censorship. Of yeah. course, I always say to people, purchase my book uh, on paper rather than on digital cop in a digital copy. And I must say that uh, I had lately confirmation uh, also from other people, that that is the way to go. Uh, because in the future, they might start censoring your book and editing exactly. Exactly. on Kindle without even you knowing that they're right. doing well, they're, they're, uh, Leo, they're burning books now. I mean, they're erasing people and figures off of Google. I mean, I could give you a, a, a bunch of research. Well, they, they erased me almost because I've been yeah. banned from YouTube uh, 17 course. times. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I had a lot of censorship, unfortunately, that uh, led me to have uh, five different Facebook profiles closed down. Uh, I had uh, uh, Twitter. It's there, but I can't access to it, even if I'm not uh, Yeah, I can't go in it. Once I they want you to read it, but not be able to do it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm actually once I, I managed to go into and suddenly I wasn't into my Twitter anymore. It was a Twitter with nothing in. And I said, but, but I'm, this is my email for that Twitter account. But, but Leo, Elon analysis. Musk is a white hat. He's he's our friend and our... <laughs> yeah, sure. That's your OBS. Uh, I'm sure that now they want to wage war against him for his political choices. And uh, some people said that now, of course, the latest move of... Uh, uh, of uh, blocking his neural link, his uh, brain computer interface. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's been blocked apparently. But 
that's because there is already Bill Gates uh, and other right. people who are working on alternatives. Right. So probably more uh, people that are more manipulated. Exactly. In, in a way, can be more easily controlled. He's definitely a maverick or an eccentric guy. A lot of people ask me about Elon. Even Infowars uh, made me this uh, awkward uh, question about Elon live when I was on Alex John I said, listen, guys, the, the guy is ambiguous. He, of he's, course. He's, he's, yes. he's a little bit... Yeah. Uh, uh, I can't trust them. Sorry, if no. I that, but I can't trust them 100%. So um, the, the the work that uh, I, I actually did, uh, uh, which is uh, this one, uh, volume 6.66, which yep. came out in early 2019, talks about the age of cybersecurity and artificial intelligence and robotics because it's and it, it refers also to when Elon Musk warned us about the AI, but he warns about things and then he used them to and his then he advantage. Does it, yeah. So it's like he's part, kind of, it's, he's part of the he's part of the universal what is it what do they they have to tell you. They have to announce their intentions. It's universal law to tell you what they're mm-hmm. gonna do to you, right? Mm-hmm. So they escape mm-hmm. the karmic debt. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> about well, I mean, in their mind, they think though. But I want, I want to go back to what you were talking about with Hollywood to get back into the deeper part of that. I want to ask yeah. you a question about An- that. another thing that uh, maybe we can talk about is the use of psychedelics, which I also oh, yeah. read very much into this book because it, it is, uh, and like I explain in my book, uh, almost the philosopher's stone for. Yeah. The alchemists, yes. uh, the mind controllers of Hollywood, yes. transform uh, these people into something else, yes. but not that's, necessarily gold. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So, in working with Roseanne, and mm. obviously I followed Roseanne's exploits and, and her, you know, leaving and obviously speaking out, and now she's mm. back. I mean, again, you know her. I don't know her. I know she knows of me too, because like, I actually have friends of friends that say, oh, you know, she's actually listened to some of your podcasts. So she's like us. She, she's in our vein. But do you think, and again, this is an opinion question and you, you, you have a deep inner knowing of Hollywood. Do you think that all of these A-list actors and actresses are unknowing, unwitting pawns, or are a lot of them initiated in some capacity? Ma, most of them are pawns into a game that they rarely know what, what is about because a lot of them are used for a period of time in their life, not uh, for their whole life. At times when they finally realize things, it's too late, uh, of course, to then go back and change things. Right. I think that Rosando has never been that kind of person. In fact, she has openly confronted uh, uh, people and shock people all her life because she doesn't give a damn. She, I mean, give a <laughs> she, she is, uh, she is just as you see her. I mean, uh, uh, the, the one thing I like about uh, Rosanne is that uh, she's very genuine and honest uh, yeah. about things. So with her, I can pick up the phone and have a chat in a very genuine and honest way. Uh, with other people in Hollywood, unfortunately, you go through layers of yeah, yeah. Uh, of like. I'm this, I'm that, I'm That's doing true. this, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing... It's like they, they, they almost uh, have to, in any case, always go back on what they are doing. Uh, Roseanne seems to be generally uh, also very much a religious person. Yeah, She's Jewish, of course, so right. she takes it from a Jewish perspective. But she has absolute respect for Christians and uh, and and Muslims alike, uh, and and she's very much uh, in tune uh, with uh, wanting to, in some way, work all together. But at the same time, she doesn't want to fall for the one yeah. world religion uh, uh, trap that they are trying to push. Uh, in uh, Hollywood, uh, I think that uh, my book shows very well, uh, right from the origins uh, of Hollywood, there was a strong Masonic as well as occult. Uh, uh, background yeah. that right. kind of like uh, uh, pushed this whole uh, uh, thing, and uh, I just wanted confirmations from people like Rosano or others about what I was discussing here uh, because I knew, of course, about the certain things. And actually, they come to me to ask, like they used to come to a, a, a dear friend of mine, the late Jordan Maxwell. Jordan Maxwell, oh, yeah, I love Jordan, uh, yeah. Yeah. was. Uh, uh, she, as, as as you and maybe all of you as know, he unfortunately died earlier, almost a year ago. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I think more or less a year ago. And uh, um, 
one of the last things that I did with Jordan was to actually bring him a copy of uh, volume seven of my confessions, which I was talking about him in, in the book because I was thanking him for all the work yeah. that he had done in the yes. past. Now, uh, Jordan uh, was also a guy that for a period of time was very much linked to certain uh, people like Manly P. Hall, who is, was a known Mason, yes. who was his mentor. And at the same time, uh, Jordan went around in the night doing uh, uh, conferences for film uh, studios, uh, uh, executives, uh, film directors like George Lucas and others who learned a lot from him. Um, he wasn't involved in any conspiracy himself actually was a guy who was simply an historian well versed yes. in symbology in the history yes. of secret societies of many other things and he was given then uh, late in life access to freemasonry as uh, he, he wanted to become a freemason in fact i mentioned this in, in in my book i show also a pic of his tribute uh, when he died that was yeah. done in a lodge here in california in Culver, and, and, and basically I wanted to explain uh, to people uh, how this uh, Gnosticism that surrounds Hollywood, you have a book which is called Gnosis right in, yeah. in your hand. Now, uh, Jordan's Gnosis story is in this book, by the way, Jordan's whole story of like where he was, how he was initiated by, you know, you know his story, but somebody, you know, some guy just showed up, he was dating the guy's daughter and they said, we've been watching you. And then, you know, they kind of initiated him and then he just became who he became. But it's, he, he's a fascinating guy. I've been very follow, following Jordan for over 20 years. Well, uh, Gnosis uh, is, uh, means knowledge, really. Now, when it comes to Gnosticism, though, that can be a little bit of a tricky business. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, Gnosticism was... Uh, uh, a bunch of heretical teachings within, within Christianity we are considered Gnostic. Gnosticism is also Gnostic Satanism, which I talk about in my book. And uh, uh, I think that uh, I know this, uh, that Jordan himself influenced very much uh, the art world, uh, meaning both cinema and music, because yeah. there were a lot of people also in the hip hop business who even sample his voice and stuff. Uh, of course, I met him late in his life, uh, so but I was able to at least try uh, have uh, a direct, you know, like awesome. we, yeah. a day to day kind of relation because he lived 20 minutes from me. I used to go often, and you know, he was just in Palm Desert and in Palm Springs. and. Uh, with a common friend who was guesting him. And I think also it was very good for him to be taken care of at the end of his life because he didn't have much luck when it came to business. He was no, no. left, yeah. right, and center. Yeah. Even his name at the end, he couldn't even use his name. I mean, Unbelievable. It's just incredible. That's, how. that's what they do. Well, well, so one other question about what you just said then about how it's their unwitting mopes. You know, because obviously we both know that the military industrial complex through the CIA, you know, MK Ultra. there's so many other forms of it that we don't even know about that, are, you know, again, MK Ultra is what they've seeded into the common collective consciousness. But is that how they, you know, dupe these actors and actresses? They are using a sub subtle form of mind control through energy, through harmonics, where they literally are tuning their brainwaves to do specific things? Or do you think they can? Okay, about for all these uh, uh, manipulation games, which actually exercise more on the public than on yeah. the actors or the film directors. Exactly. Because those people are simply bought and paid for by the studios who go there and say, you want to do it? Okay. But if you don't do it the way we want you, you're not going to get the money. You're not going to get the financing. The military industrial complex, so when you want to do a movie about war, it's okay, but they want to see the script. They will edit the script if they don't like it. Jerry Bruckheimer does all the military and did all the Transformers. He does, it's like one, it's always one director yeah. because he's on their payroll. Yeah. And uh, like I, like I show in, in my book, there is actually since the 30s and 40s, let's say more or less, uh, uh, there is uh, the collaboration with the military industrial complex started in 1915. Wow. So with the first film that they collaborated in, uh, which was called Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith. Yeah, D. yeah, D. W. Griffith, yeah. A free Freemason who the year after produced in, uh, Intolerance. Intolerance which led to that... Uh, uh, Hollywood Babylon myth because the scenography used for that movie uh, was left there for various years 
Wow. And it was a, the scenography was based on ancient wow. Babylon, the gates of Easter and everything else. And then uh, in 1991, uh, uh, Kenneth Tanger did a documentary about it. And 10 years later, in 2001, the Ovation uh, shopping mall opened up next to the Kodak Theater where they give the Oscars, the, the Dolby Theater. You now uh, it's uh, basically the place... Uh, reconstructed on the scenography of intolerance, but that is basically with Enki, with all the images from ancient Sumeria, <laughs> all the deities of ancient Babylon. But it was a guy called Kenneth Anger, who I used to know, involved also with the OTO, making underground movies that are rich, literary rituals, uh, which uh, started to talk about Hollywood Babylon uh, with yeah. uh, these books he made, Hollywood Babylon 1 and 2. Now, these books were so scandalous so that when the first one came out in the US, first it came out in France, they were actually selling it in a kind of a package that you can put it in so the people could, didn't see the cover because it was regarded as too scandalous to show the cover. So they sell it like in a paper kind of folded the finger that, uh, you know. So that is basically uh, what, what was happening with uh, with Hollywood Babylon. It was showing uh, the real side of Hollywood, uh, the yeah. murders, the drugs, the, uh, the, the, the suicides, the assassinations, the scandals that really from the very early stages, the 1920s, from the age of silence movies. Yeah. And is that age that now Brad Pitt is portraying uh, in the film Babylon, you know, that is now having a lot of success, but is actually showing you the depravation of that era, just as well as the TV series Strange Angel showed us Parsons, the OTO, and the links with Hollywood in that TV series. I think a couple of series went on on CBS a few years back. There wasn't a third series, but it's definitely something to 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 to, to watch. Uh, and behind all this, though, we have to understand uh, who is behind all this. The Rockefeller Foundation, the military industrial complex, a complex, the links of the Rockefeller Foundations, the, how the Rockefellers made their money and then uh, how they were linked to the Rothschilds, how they are linked basically to the Sabbatian Frankist who yeah. made Hollywood. Because yeah. we talked in the past about Sabbatian Frankist. Yeah. I, of course, I talk about them in volume seven. We discussed yes. deeply. And by the way, David Icke always talks about them too. <laughs> But the thing is that I think I'm the only author who in volume four of my confessions uh, uh, discussed also the links between the Sabbateans and the Jesuits and the Freemasons because that's a very complex yes. uh, uh, word that not very many people know. And I'm very glad that uh, David finally changed his tune and started to talk about the problem within Judaism because yes. Uh, yes. unfortunately I don't think... Uh, he did it in time because now he's branded as an anti-Semite and he's, he's not done, even yeah. let into yeah. certain countries. They didn't let him into Australia. I think. Unreal. It's, it's Unreal. Or even in the European Union, now that England is not part of it anymore, he had problems for doing a conference, I heard, from the, from the sun. Um, I am uh, grateful to, like I said in my previous book, to David, because he gave me a break in 2006 when I started my first blog exposing my... Confessions of an Illuminati. Um, we then never really met or never really did an interview together, but I've been in contact at times with his son, a very nice guy. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, the problem with David and me is that he regards me as too much of an aristocrat from an English background that he doesn't really like. I, you know, can, I, mean, I can connect you with him. I mean, that's my gift, man. I'll be like, David, you and Leo need to do a, a podcast. And I, think be, that, I think that that will we'll be, be the, the MC. <laughs> it will be definitely a great event if it ever happens. Oh, it but, be amazing. I, I don't know if it's in – the problem with David seems to be that uh, um, he's a very – of course, politically, is totally to the left. He used to yes. be in the Green Party and all yes. that. I think that at this, at this moment of time uh, – Politics sucks. All, all, all no politics. There is no politics. People like us cannot be on a side at all, Leo. No. No. Really. I mean, I, uh, of course, encouraged uh, people to uh, support Trump uh, during his presidency or before. And even now he's uh, gone. Uh, during uh, the Italians for Trump experience, which I had, uh, 
I don't know about now. I think that uh, still he's a good candidate, but the problem is that he listened too much to his advisors. Yeah, as- no, no, no. He got destroyed, dude. He's no, there's no chance. I mean, honestly, the entire right wing uh, side it's of a the problem. world. Yeah, I know yeah. it's a problem because they, they seem to, unfortunately, you see, they, they seem to fall for the, the same kind of uh, tactics now that. Uh, were used by the neocons that transformed the Republican Party in an appendix of right, exactly of the Democrats because you didn't see really the difference between George W. Bush right. policies, George Bush father, or or Bill Clinton or Obama. It was all the same cool. shit. They're all the same shit. Now <laughs> we must say that Trump did something different. I still uh, hope that he does it again because I think that uh, there is always a hope that we can maybe save the State of the Union. Because you have to understand that if this uh, State of the Union is, uh, I mean, not that I uh, don't know yet about the State of the Union address, the State of our Union in the sense that keeping this United States of America, which is risking very much in 2024-25 to start shifting apart with uh, with 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 states that will go their own way if this continues now what i'm encouraging is of course uh, a micro like i did in volume 7 uh, micro communities that of course are less and less dependent from what whatever is federal law or federal uh, uh, impositions and this is possible still to a certain extent however when, uh, you know, every single judge, district attorney, politician is bought by George Soros, it's very difficult to do all this. So uh, I, with um, with the friends of Jordan, uh, Maxwell, uh, with uh, the guy who actually took care of him until uh, the, the last day, which is Brian uh, Vecchio, uh, Brian, we, we put together a project because with Jordan, we had put together an order, order of the new dawn, uh, I was like, Jordan, are you sure you want to put together an order? I mean, I was like, I, I remember I was in front of the sweep, we were all sitting and said, Jordan, this is going to be a headache. People are going to think we are Illuminati, this, that, you know, start saying all kinds of things. I said, but uh, Jordan was, no, no, but I think that we can still do it this way because in any way, we can't just uh, um, throw pear to the pigs because people don't appreciate certain things at times. So it's better to do it in a more structural way. I said, okay. And uh, we uh, called a few people. We had a foundation gathering meeting, let's say. And uh, this uh, reality, this order we created is now in charge of his estate because he actually left the state in the hands of Brian. And uh, and one of the projects, of course, is to develop this uh, uh, new dawn. But uh, the main thing that we were trying to develop and we are trying to develop is the idea of micro communities that uh, can be uh, totally self-sufficient the moment of societal collapse. Yeah, Because that is supposed to happen at one point or the other within the next seven years. So right. we don't have that much time. And uh, uh, I must say that Jordan had a lot of following. So a lot of people go to his website and stuff. And automatically in the next couple of months, they will be readdressed to our website. That's awesome. So we, we will try in a way to promote all this. Regarding uh, the, 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 the book uh, that, of course, uh, here uh, <laughs> I'm presenting today, there is an ominous picture on it, which is the nuclear explosion. Of course, uh, we are uh, taking also input from uh, the mythical Dr. Strange Lab. The fact that uh, the military industrial complex uh, had definitely always a control over anything that was done in Hollywood, okay? But uh, they had also different approach back there. The, there was a different approach. Uh, there was the approach of the 50s that was basically to scare the shit out of everybody regarding these nuclear explosions. And then, whoa, until the 80s, we lived in fear. The day after, ah, you know, it was like. You remember that they would make us march out and like get down behind our desks? Nuclear it was, it yeah, was, it, was, it was crazy. But this is basically something that happened. And uh, I'm, uh, uh, of course, <laughs> nowadays, uh, young people don't understand what happened. In the <laughs> they don't know anything. They've been, it's no. been deleted from history. Yeah. 
It was like they don't understand that there was a military industrial complex that was working uh, with, of course, the entertainment business uh, in a very direct way. When, when I say when I say Sting and the song Russians, that should define it. It's one of the things that I talk about in this book. Now, Russians uh, love their children too. It was so dramatic to <laughs> see. And we were broadcast from the powerful uh, satellite antennas of, of MTV, which was used in a way to push. MTV. Wow. Yeah, MTV used uh, from the satellite to push and break the barriers yeah. of, uh, like you know. Wall. Uh, yeah. break the wall in a way no? and they managed they managed it was like people were however uh, like I say in my book people were very different from how they are now they were much more innocent they could actually believe in all the bullshit that was put in front of them much more easier back then uh, so um, in, 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 in this work of mine I start explaining the manipulation of the frequencies even the tuning of the music from uh, from 1939, when uh, they uh, went for a fine tuning in 440 hertz instead of 440, uh, 432, the foundation of the ISO after the war, the industry of standardization to standardize everything. You know, you have to tune. Everybody has to tune in a certain way their instruments. Everybody has to uh, have this. It was like the standardization that kind of is part of this globalization. And uh, um, there was, though, a lot of people don't know, direct links between all the record companies. And I, of course, I worked as a record producer, so I know a lot of them. I used to have direct relations with them, both as a DJ and uh, as a promoter. At one point in London in the 90s, I had an agency for the promotion of music, of dance music. So I used to get tracks and contacts with all the PRs, A&Rs, whatever, of all the companies. And people don't know that RCA, for example, is born within the military industrial complex. The EMI, EMI is born within the military industrial complex. Maybe not the American one, but the English one. Every single record company, the big ones that exploded with all these new sensational sounds, music in the 50s, were all working previously in the First and Second World War to develop technologies that will help the war. Because a radio was, first of all, a technology of communication that you could operate within the realms of the military industrial complex. Then it became also an entertainment thing. And the same, though, can't be said for the TV that was already born within a context in which people knew already that uh, it could be a way of manipulating from the very early stages TV became... Uh, that uh, that thing and then of course uh, all the news companies that we see nowadays prevailing in our society because they are part of the mainstream media they are all linked nbc msnbc cbs abc when you go and analyze where they get you know who found them their links with the rockefellers the links with other big uh, families but also with the military industrial complex you understand that, that there is no free media. Right. There, is, there is no free media. And at the same time, you, you can understand how they have manipulated people using also uh, music and entertainment as well as cinema. You know, the, when, when it comes to one of the first uh, productions that, of course, uh, shocks everybody uh, from the very early days of Colored, it uh, was Fantasia, the cartoon of Walt Disney, regarded as, wow. This Walt is Disney, wow. It's just the name Walt Disney just sends shockwaves up your spine if you know what's going on. <laughs> well, no, because then, you know, at that time he was an anti-communist, or at least he was perceived as such. He was Supposedly. working. No, but at that time, but we went from Walt Disney being the defender uh, of the American dream against communism right. from the Walt Disney of today, which is promoting Satanism and leftism, <laughs> woke ideology uh, all the way. So I wanted to explain what happened in between to the people because otherwise people are a little bit confused, no? Uh, we went through the McCarthy era, we went through the Red Scare, we went through all that. So what, did, what happened in reality in Hollywood? 
And so uh, in this book, I try to explain that. I try to explain the transformation that Hollywood went through. And and and, and, and with that, we can go back to that philosopher's stone, that yeah. alchemical concept around LSD, which I actually discuss also in a in a new article I just published on Yosagami.com regarding also Prince Harry, which is now becoming the poster boy of psychedelics because, oh, suddenly Prince Harry confesses that he's oh, using psychedelics and they're part of his life and they're, they're the, you know, like the pillar of his new life here in America is taking psychedelics. Well, uh, people need to know the truth, need to know how psychedelics have been used for good, but also for bad. I mean, of course, my father was a psychiatrist. And so aside from having a grandmother from my English side who was involved with show business, who used to teach acting, who used to work with Fellini, Zeffirelli, the Dolce Vita, she appeared in movies and stuff. I also have the fact that my father was a very important psychiatrist who worked with Meyer, who was a second, was basically the disciple of Carl Gustav Jung. He was offered a position in in in, in Geneva, actually, sorry, in Zurich at the Jung Institute. And so he explained at one point that he couldn't take any more working within the psychiatric environment because it was completely corrupted and controlled and used for things that he didn't really want to have anything to do with because uh, he saw with his own eyes people locked up in mental asylums for their political ideas, even in the West. When the West was accusing Russia of doing that, the Soviet Union of arresting people uh, because they were uh, political dissidents and locking them up in mental institutes, the West wasn't doing anything different and was actually experimenting a lot also in, in mental institutes. The MK Ultra, you asked me earlier, MK Ultra used massive doses of LSD. Yeah. And they never really admitted uh, the results of their experimentations. You can now easily access even Hollywood. freedom of information. Yeah, yeah. No, well, you can access, of course, through the freedom of information a number sanitized. of sanitized. <laughs> yeah, sanitized. But, but you can never arrive to know the full truth. That's right. In uh, my book, I explain how since the fifties in Hollywood uh, they started with uh, with certain people to spread this LSD. There was, of course, later on also the figure of Timothy Leary, which I had yeah, the possibility of, of meeting who invited openly people to use it. But then there was Cary Grant. There were a lot of people in Hollywood that started to take this LSD. What did it do? Uh, it, it transformed people, uh, yeah. film directors, actors, uh, um, in, in, into something different. We went from the highly conservative uh, approach of the 50s, gradually, into the 70s, in which... At uh, one point, we couldn't, uh, I mean, it was filled with the films, which are obviously the result of their psychedelic experiments. Now, I'm not saying that psychedelia has started actually influencing uh, uh, movies uh, back then, because in reality, psychedelics uh, were used uh, from a very early stage in Hollywood. And even Fantasia that we discussed a moment right. ago is listed as a psychedelic film. Because apparently it had a lot, of, a lot of elements that were taken. Uh, probably Walt Disney himself was, as he was an initiate, as he was an Illuminati, he was a, somebody who wasn't stupid right. and, and was linked to the establishment. He was, like many others, experimenting with these things. Uh, I explained how Ados Axley, The Doors of Perception, this uh, Brave New World, it was all part not of necessarily... Uh, you know, just an innocent uh, academic kind of uh, uh, liter literature work. Uh, Axley was a guy who was directly involved with MK Ultra. And Bob, uh, when he came here, when he moved here, he uh, became part of it. And it was California, that place uh, where I am broadcasting from, from now, uh, where you used to live yourself, <laughs> is California the stronghold of this transformation? Uh, transformation that, of course, uh, used also the New Age phenomena, uh, which uh, is, is still part of this whole problem. And uh, in California, we had a number of secret societies that sprang up. The first, San Francisco, so the 
birth of the first Rosicrucian body by Pascal Beverly Randolph, who later practiced, was the first one to publish and practice sexual magic, publish material about sexual magic, and influence people later on like Alice Crowley. But his first lodge was founded in San Francisco, here in, uh, in uh, basically near San Diego, Oceanside. There was uh, another guy who was also involved. Uh, there is a number of uh, secret societies that sprang up right from here, from California, in the last hundred years, that were, of course, uh, also uh, influential. And in Hollywood, though, the one that, uh, like I explained in my book, managed to influence more than any others the culture of Hollywood, apart from the Freemasons, of course, that are present everywhere, though, uh, the OTO, the Ordo Tempi Orientis, that, of course, saw also after the takeover of Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley, like I explained in my book, uh, uh, saw the potential, the, the perverse potential of Hollywood, described Hollywood as a place of people who were indulging in cocaine, orgies, and whatnot. That seemed the ideal place where he could launch his own telemic religion. And in fact, it was in a side road of Hollywood Boulevard that the first Gnostic Mass of Alistair Crowley took place. It wasn't in London, it wasn't in Cairo, it wasn't in Paris, it was in Hollywood. So People need to understand there is actually a direct link here with an event and with uh, people that were highly influential for uh, the, ca the American culture. That's why in this book I say from the rise of the Antichrist to the sound of the devil and the great, because that rise of the Antichrist implies uh, manipulating, brainwashing people, destroying their values, the values of Hollywood, that Hollywood gradually managed to destroy, to, to change. We are not the same people we were 100 years ago, mostly because we saw those movies and, and, and because we listened to certain music. Now, in the music business, even more than in the cinema, there is the there has been from a very early stage, especially after the war and then after the start of the rock and roll revolution, and after, of course, Elvis led the way. But Elvis wasn't just an innocent guy. He was the product of a military-industrial complex. Right. I mean, it's just... Yeah. So, so that is important to understand. The, the way that the experimented, no? He was the first guy to break those boundaries with sexuality and music, attaching his genitals, then something <laughs> that Michael Jackson will do openly a million. Nowadays, of course, we have Rihanna openly, I don't know, uh, the next thing we know is that they have, uh, I don't know, a, a break in between uh, the match in which they start doing some porno openly because yeah. this is the next move. I mean, are you using therapeutic peptides? Are you a new user, maybe an advanced user? Maybe you're considering starting peptides. Highly recommend going to the link right below, thepeptidescourse.com forward slash 10 dash mistakes and download my PDF and learn what not to do before starting therapeutic peptides. Of course, this year, the uh, the devil uh, promoted the with, uh, with rich, devil. promoted with horns uh, flames and transsexual and LGBT and by the way supported and sponsored by Moderna you know, no no Pfizer, Pfizer Pfizer same thing whatever they're all the same <laughs> just uh, just, uh, just so so they are sponsored by something that of course we know is part of the problem. Unbelievable. And and also that link with the big farm and entertainment. And now big yeah. farm is something that I discuss in my book yes. from very early stages because yes. I think it was important that people know more about big pharma. They know about the Flexner report. Yep. The very yep. origins of how big pharma was put together, especially yep. now. The Rockefellers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, okay. I mean... The, the sound of warfare, uh, it's, it's basically a product. Um, everything that we've seen uh, financed by the Rothschild, the Rockefeller Alliance, right, right, right. Uh, it has influenced not only 
uh, the, the, the show business, but of course has uh, involved also the, the U.S. Navy as well as other part of the U.S. military. And that's why then I, I say, well, we have a guy who claims he was actually sent by the Navy Intelligence, Hubbard, arrives in a lodge of the OTO that he claims he's investigating. In reality, when he goes off in the desert here in, and starts a, a, a ritual for, the, for, for, for basically evoking the Antichrist. And, and he does it with Parsons and the guys. Uh, and then later on, he becomes the founder of Scientology, which is an still to, to this day, Scientology is regarded as a, such a powerful force Right. Apparently, yeah. apparently, the third book in the uh, Hollywood Babylon installment by uh, Kenneth Tanger yep. didn't come out because it was talking too much about Scientology. Yeah. They, yeah. Uh, he still is in, uh, living and he probably wants to stay alive the longest time possible. Right. So Kenneth Tanger now is almost 100 years old. No, he's very old. Uh, but uh, he knows that he, he can't touch. And he can't put out that subject at the moment. So imagine the power they still have within. Uh, well, I wanted, I wanted to share this with you, and you don't know this about me, but because um, you just know me as in this industry. But you know where I my quote unquote claim to fame in the internet is 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 in health optimization, and you know I'm like one of the biggest you know subject matter experts, whatever you want to call it, on peptides and alternative you know forms of healing, bioregulators, which are now coming out of Russia. You know, we know in my side of the uh, fence that the Russians built um, medicines, you know, call them healing technologies that were the opposite of what the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds were building, which were petroleum distillate. Well, but because we know that from the Flexner report, uh, basically uh, everything that was homeopathic, that was natural, was banned. Uh, it was <laughs> in the very early stages of that uh, the big pharma decided to do that. Uh, when the Flexner report uh, yes. was published in 1910, yes. it suddenly... 1910, by the way. Yes. 1910! Yeah, it's a long time ago. They and buried it. Nobody yeah, yeah. knows. Nobody knows, and it changed the course of American medicine. It changed the course of the world. They, yeah, because they had these 155 medical schools located throughout North right. America right. that uh, basically uh, were, in a way, part of this uh, uh, report uh, conducted by this Abram Flexner Flex and evaluated the various teaching methods used in each school to set up and pre-order this uh, standardized system of medicine. And uh, it must be said that basically the 19th century medical training was mainly implemented in three ways uh, that I define in my book. The internship uh, uh, programs which were, where local doctors provided students with practical education, the private institution where doctors lecture groups of students in their own medical school, and then you had undergraduate uh, internship yeah. programs in which students receive a combination of didactic and clinical training. But in all this, uh, because, because uh, you know, in America there were over 650 already back then uh, medical schools, uh, and, and so the, 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 the whole idea was to basically unify under uh, the control of the Rockefeller and the Carnegie groups, uh, the, the whole of medicine in a, into a single system. And uh, into a single system that rejected any kind, any form of natural medicine. Uh, they were held by a guy called Edward Bernays, who yeah, died, in, uh, died in 1990. Power of persuasion. <laughs> yeah, he was one of the first spin doctors who uh, understood how to manipulate you now using uh, probably what was, uh, uh, we can consider the very early stages of neurolinguistic programming. Which By the is way, when you say spin doctor, what, what image pop, what pops in my mind is George Stephanopoulos. <laughs> yeah, 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 he is one in a way. No, classical spin doctor. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And and, NBC, CBS, NBC for literally like 10 years, we go now to George Stephanopoulos yes. for your comments. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, these people are uh, the, the product uh, of all this, and they, right. they are they are the finance. I mean, when you see the amount of money that is given 
to uh, MSNBC, NBC or whatever by all these companies. At one point, uh, until, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, there was a period for, for uh, I think they stopped, but they lasted a few weeks. NBC on the evening news with Lester Holt, you will see, sponsored by Pfizer. You know, it's like, it was like... Uh, and it was like the big pharma was openly telling you that they control the narrative. Now, uh, the, the, the Flexen report needs to be addressed uh, because it led to what is now, back, uh, what I said in my book, it's called vaccinocracy, uh, the, 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 the vaccine, uh, uh, the era of the vaccinations, uh, now the large scale forced vaccinations that, uh, of course, we saw with the recent pandemic and will probably continue uh, forever and ever, because it seems like you now they, they kind of like understood the weakness of the people. They understood that, that some people at one point, when they are, you know, people like us might resist, but the majority of people, when they start having the first problems, oh, you can't go here, you can't go there, you can't have a job if you don't do this or that, they will say, okay, fine. And then, and so Abraham Flexner. Uh, was connected to the petrochemical pharmaceutical partnership of the IG Farben and Rockefeller uh, and uh, defend any form of natural medicine right from the beginning to monopolize the entire contemporary health system for their own gain. In, imagine already in 1906, the AMA published medical education, a medical education directory of all the medical schools in the United States, exab- establishing already back then the establishment requirements. And uh, gradually this, uh, this establishment requirements uh, meant that you couldn't really ask too much or go too much into the direction of uh, homeopathy or natural medicine, which only surfaced in the last few decades, thanks to uh, the fact that we can maybe have access to modern technologies like the internet and, 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 and maybe spreading the news about this or this other supplement that can help us right. rather than taking some chemical product that instead, instead can damage us. Because the, the, the big pharma gives, big pharma takes. Big pharma always gives you a product that seems good, but then obviously when you go and read, you know, it's, it's every time, you know, it's like when they do the publicity on TV, this product is great. Then, then in, in, in a few seconds, very fast, they say, uh, what did they say? And it's, and it's basically, you, you listen, it says, well, this medicine can affect your heart, they can make you have diarrhea, can basically kill you and all that. They say it at the end, it's like, don't do it, you know, it's basically the warning that the big pharma puts at the end of every single commercial in the United States. And you are like, is it worth it? Yeah. Okay, I'm diabetic, but do I really want to take, for example, I'm not diabetic, but I'm making an example. Uh, I, do I really want to take this medicine? Because then the side effects are so many. So it's... Right. Uh, well, that, that's what, so this is what I wanted to tell you. It's very difficult to tell you, talk to you because you're so fucking smart <laughs> that you go off on tangents and I'm like, I got to let him talk. I can't say anything, but no, what I was going to say, no, no, what I was, no, I'm not saying it in an insult. I'm saying it as a compliment to you, but what I was going to say to what you just got to was they knew that the petroleum distillate medication model, again, the Rockefellers and, you know, whoever is behind them, the interdimensionals behind them, they knew that it would wear out the biological systems and the organ systems of humans to the point where they would make more money off of what you just said, which was ca- creating more drugs to cover the side effects. But, this is I think that, yeah. demonic shit that started a hundred plus years ago. So you, you have to ask the question, like who would be behind destroying human beings in such an evil, wicked fashion? Yeah. I mean, they don't have that idea. They have the idea of preserving themselves above all and preserving their own way uh, in society, their own system uh, above all. I mean, Big Pharma was born because of the germ theory of the chemist Louis Pasteur. Uh, That was the beginning of it all. uh, But nowadays, we all know that if you take uh, uh, antibiotics, 
for a period of time, then they will not be as effective and yeah. gradually they will have no effect. So the, the yeah. thing is that my father, who was a, a, a doctor, he was a psychiatrist, but he was also um, a surgeon. He, was, he had various, uh, he had taken various, uh, of course, uh, degrees of study when he became a doctor. He explained me from a very early age, we don't take in a family antibiotics for a reason. And I was like, but everybody takes them when they have this, they have that. And, and my father was like, no, because you are going to weaken your system and one day they're not going to have any more. And plus, they are weakening the whole of the system. Like you said, and then the solution comes again from the big pharma. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but it's like, uh, of course, it's like basically uh, uh, giving you a punch in the face That's and then right. say, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So if, are, if, no, yeah. I can, no, so I can break your, <laughs> your, your teeth, but I can, I can pay for your dentist. <laughs> I can so, bring you to the dentist. So that's what? fine. Yeah, I want to be broken my teeth because then you want to bring me to the dentist. It's 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 a, the idea that I can offer you something uh, because I, I've, I've of course been the subject of a problem that unfortunately came out of nowhere. No, it didn't come out of nowhere. They are the instigators and the Hegelian dialect, problem, reaction, solution. But yeah. here, the other thing about what you just said, and this is something that I went through with my wife's mother, mm. who died, who who died from this. Because of the antibiotic antibiotic resistance yeah. that is now prevalent in every single hospital, trauma center, and urgent care uh, building or facility in the world, yeah. if you are over the age of 60, very few people know this, and we found this out because we lost her mom, but if you're over the age of 60 and you have an invasive surgical procedure, it could literally be cutting out a tissue, a colonoscopy, anything that's invasive. You literally have to sign an affidavit in the hospital that says that you have a, I, I'm not making this up, Leo, you mm -hmm. have a 50% chance of death from post-surgical infection because the antibiotics are so powerful. I mean, the, uh, the resistant strains to the antibiotics are so powerful and they're pervasive across surgical steel. And nobody even knows that. So every time you go into the hospital over the age of 60 to have anything cut out of you, it's a coin flip that you don't die from the sur surgery. A coin so you, flip. you basically have to sign uh, off uh, their own responsibilities. They're going to be killing you almost. You know, it's crazy. In California, uh. if the, you die, you can't sue because they lean every blood relative in the family for three years and then they pay you based on an actuary table of your age, right? So a 60 year old man or woman who's retired and doesn't make income gets $250,000, but they won't get it for at least three years. And everyone in the family is leaned. So you can't buy a house. You can't buy a car. You can't do anything. That's how big the lobby is in the medical industrial complex in just California. I'm assuming it's the same in every state. Hmm. It's unbelievable, dude. Crazy, crazy. And uh, going back to Flexner, because he wrote this report uh, at, at, at the time, Flexner wrote this report, uh, uh, at the time uh, he was also connected to a guy called John Marshall uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation, who together with uh, Hans Heisler and the more famous Theodore Adorno, began to work on a program with money from the Rockefeller Foundation called Research Program on the Relation Between Music and Films. Now, that program and that relation, I mean, that they work, that report that they put together, uh, is uh, particularly important in understanding also because uh, uh, this, uh, this research that uh, was conducted also on the composition of music for films or addressing the relation of music and films was based also on the effect that the sounds, the music, everything will have while you were physically in the cinema, no? Right. And, 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 and you will be bombarded by this, uh, this uh, because then we... We can now we have uh, we, we arrive to to the, to the classical cinemas in which you go in and you are suddenly, yeah, and and you are 
in, in a way, you are a victim immediately of a brainwashing manipulation game that you can't even avoid. Once you go in that, it's your own choice. You're, because it's not like watching the film at home. You can put down this, the, the, the volume or you can simply say, OK, I'm going to turn it off. You are going to the cinema and you are subject to that experience, which for them was also to manipulate people. However, uh, these uh, three authors, including Adorno, were at the time protagonists of musical projects uh, at the service of major commercial and military interest also. And in his work, uh, The Philosophy of Modern Music from 1938, uh, Theodore Adorno, who was also an important uh, exponent, uh, let's not forget, of another, uh, the, the Frankfurt School. Now, the Frankfurt School is at the basis of what now we call the woke ideology. Yeah. People don't know that. So I wanted in my book to explain how the work ideology was born out of the Frankfurt School, how the Frankfurt School was born out of the Sabbatean Frankist and out of certain lodges. We're talking about Frankfurt, which was directly connected with also the rise of the Rothschild family. And so I, I tried in my book to also explain how uh, these, uh, these, uh, these characters, uh, I mean, uh, Adorno wrote that basically uh, the, 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 the music imp it imprints uh, uh, upon an attitude uh, and uh, it's like uh, it's like can bring you into mental illness. Uh, he actually wrote about it. They knew that the, 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 the concern, their own concern was to dominate uh, uh, the actual... Uh, uh, the actual psychology of the person is not simply composing music. It's not simply composing music. Adorno uh, added uh, once that necrophilia is the ultimate expression oh. of true help in the sick society. So, I mean, it's like Jesus Christ, uh, necrophilia. And, uh, and uh, so, this is, uh, uh, this is incredible because then. The other guy who worked with the Theodor Adorno, Hans Eisler, he also had a very particular kind of, uh, of, 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 of life. And, uh, and these are not normal kind of, 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 of people. They are connected to the Rockefeller Foundation. But then after, they also are connected with other things that we didn't really know much about regarding also their connection to East Germany, to communism, uh, to... Uh, so, so it's like uh, uh, Eisler was accused of being the Karl Marx of music. He ended up basically being deported and going to ended up in East Germany. And I think he even composed the the hymn of East Germany. I mean, it was like so. These people were maybe, you know, they were versatile in moving from one side to the other of what per, was perceived to be the two great opposite blocks at the time. Nowadays. Uh, we have uh, a new uh, Cold War, let's, if we want to call it in that way, in which, though, we, our own national debt is owned partly by China. Yep. I mean, so the confrontation with China, what is going to bring? I mean, it's obvious that China is going to threaten our supply chains, but, but China is going gonna, is gonna to threaten a lot more also because they are already imposing on us, uh, for example, in Hollywood... Uh, in the last few years, uh, suddenly we have uh, Chinese superhero, Chinese protagonist everywhere. Even it's, 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 I don't know if you ever seen movies lately. I don't remember the company exactly that uh, it's, uh, does a lot of production also on Hollywood movies. They are a Chinese company. You can see their, their own Chinese name. And then suddenly you see one of the protagonists is, of course, Chinese. <laughs> In the middle of scenarios where Chinese person shouldn't even be there because the, his, the, 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 the story they are t talking about doesn't really fit that, but they have to put a Chinese person because exactly. of course, and possibly in a role that is heroic, yep. that is kind of like... It's subliminal. It's all subliminal. Well, but America uh, was very much... Uh, um, Not clued in. Well, no, America was very much with a Hollywood that was partisan towards uh, partisan in the sense that it was pro-America. Hollywood was That's right, new, baby. right. Yeah, but now it's not any longer. Now 
Hollywood is partly owned by Russians, by Chinese, by people who don't necessarily want the good of America. And so the films, the product that they will uh, put out there is not necessarily good for us. It is not necessarily pushing. Like we said earlier, we have uh, the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, who is also influencing most of Hollywood CEOs that are actors even who go to his yearly meetings in Davos. But then you have also the money that uh, at times it comes, like I said, from uh, from places like China. And so it would be like, paradoxically, in, if in the 1950s or 60s, suddenly films were financed by East Germany. It would be impossible. I mean, people would say, are you crazy? I mean, East Germany is financed. So it, it didn't happen back then because we, we knew better. Instead, now, it's like... Uh, uh, America comes last, even in the film industry, and everything American comes last in the film industry. So that's why these days, when you go on Netflix, uh, out of ten films, uh, half of them talk another language, subtitles. They don't. They don't even. Uh, they're not even American films anymore. And you are w watching them with the subtitles, and th that can be interesting. I mean, I don't have anything against movies from other countries or stuff. But it, it, it shows you that Netflix is not a product of America. It's a product of globalization. And it's also, I call it the admiralship of Satan, because they promote everything that I dislike, that, uh, you know, from the Jesus mocked into, in a Brazilian comedy to uh, Braz Jesus mocked as gay, I mean, crazy stuff uh, or yeah. little children paraded uh, in kind of pedophile series or or satanic occult series is blatantly satanic or 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 maybe portraying the illuminati in a funny way because you know uh with uh, with a comedian who 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 suddenly uh kind of uh portrays the Illuminati in a funny way. I mean, that, that is something that, of course, uh, with Mike Myers, we have seen lately <laughs> on Netflix. And it's, right. it, it is another way also of normalizing the idea of a conspiracy. Yeah, right. you know, the Illuminati, yeah, they're funny, they think that this, that, that, the secret societies, they do this and that. It's, it's funny. It's, uh, it's a little bit like when... Uh, the same thing was done many decades an hour ago with the Simpsons when they did that famous episode of the Stonecutters and uh, they were pushing uh, towards uh, presenting to their audience uh, the idea of Freemasonry, embellishing it and making it like uh, we control the world, but it's all fun and it's all fine and dandy. So I, I, I think that uh, in, in, in my book, I try to explain all this, as well as going very much in depth in the, uh, in the controversy, as well as uh, also in, in the way that cinema these days uh, has been uh, constructed for sending a message, a message that, of course, is also an awkward message, a bell me message initially that uh, was still present from the very early days of Hollywood. I mean, already in the 1920s, they started to, to have occult leaning movies. Yeah, yeah. And uh, with the excuse of horror movies, you insert the elements of the occult no? and normalize it. Uh, the, the, the figure of... Uh, of, of Alistair Crowley, for example, was already present uh, in, in one of the earliest uh, movies that, uh, that, uh, that were done in Hollywood, as, as well as, as, uh, as often regarded as a hero by people like James Franco. James Franco, for, you know, it's a typical example of uh, uh, this uh, perverse uh, Hollywood... Uh, actor and film director who recently was even involved in a scandal. He created an acting school where he was basically having sex with all the ladies there, uh, openly having orgies, inviting everybody to have an orgy while he was supposedly teaching acting. I don't know what kind of acting was that. <laughs> but he um, 
he actually uh, became a uh, he graduated with uh, a thesis on Kenneth Anger on uh, and he was linked uh, he worked with Kenneth Anger uh, in the production of a video for his uh, musical duo that he has because he has, also does music and uh, he apparently also um, instigated this uh, ritual that took place in Venice Beach in 2012, which uh, I think it didn't do anything good for Venice Beach because since then Venice Beach has gone no. worse than it already was. I no. mean, Venice Beach is no longer the place, uh, but even then, w- what was Venice Beach? The place where uh, Jim Morrison was hanging around, but Jim Morrison himself is a product of the media industry. Yeah, exactly. Right. Himself was inspired by the doors of perception of Huxley, who was the head of MK Ultra. He himself was very much obsessed with Alistair Crowley, and he himself apparently died in very mysterious circumstances, like a lot of people in the show business that are used and then are either sacrificed or eliminated when they are not uh, uh, they are not regarded as useful in any way. <laughs> Right. And, the, candle, and, the candle only burns so bright for so long in Hollywood. <laughs> and they seem to have this diabolic synchronicity that directs us always to dying at 27, sorry, 27, age, age, uh, uh, 27 years of age, which is kind of like a bit particular uh, synchronicity that, uh, uh, not necessarily a conspiracy, I'm saying, but definitely a synchronicity of sorts. And uh, another number that is very important in the occult and in the show business, like I explained in my book, is the number 23. That's why this year is a very particular year, having said that number 23 is in it, now 2023. And 23 is the number connected to, uh, to William Barrows, which was also very much a very strong uh, source of inspiration for many people including David Bowie, including many others. And I also talk in my book about a secret society that uh, inspired the the rave scene. Because people think of the rave scene as an innocent thing. Everybody started taking ecstasy and dropping it, and everything was like, uh, no? But the rave scene actually had an awkward background, and I explain it all in my book. The connection with the secret society known as the Temple of Psychic Youth and a guy known as Genesis P. Orridge. So that is also an interesting element of my book. It's amazing, bro. I mean, I I just want to say, you know, before I let you go, you know, because obviously we always do on the podcast that you and I do. And by the way, for everybody who's watching the show, I mean, I've had him on for six and seven. And obviously we, I think actually I've had you on four times because me and Mike, me, remember me, you and Michael Jaco. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and, we were, and we were talking about the, or, your original books, but, but uh, you and I have done three podcasts and we did it on six, seven and eight. But I wanted to ask you, you know, just for purposes of solutions, and I know you went really deep on solutions and personal sovereignty in in, in, in seven, and this is more of an analysis. Well, no, here here actually I give solutions, first of all, regarding the use of music, the way you have to listen to music to not get damaged. (laughs) Yeah, possibly that, but also, for example, not use for long periods of time headphones. uh, uh, And and, and actually the use of music simply in in a responsible way because it creates, it can create, but apart from the fact, like I said, the frequency, the frequency that was uh, uh, decided uh, in 1939 by Goebbels uh, uh, in a period just before between 38 and 39, before the beginning of the war, in which there was a collaboration also with the English, with the BBC, they decided to standardize the frequencies so the music doesn't have that same level of... uh, Because music can really bring you in contact with the divine as well as bring you in contact with the demonic. The music, uh, like I explained in my book, can be a way to elevate yourself. But they didn't want that. They want... uh, to oppress us, and so music uh, is made out of uh, also quality of frequencies, and the quality of frequencies went down the drain. First uh, from vinyl, we went into CD. CD already had a cap of 44.1 Hz. From CD, we went into MP3, even worse, and then the frequency became even more mashed, and, and in the end, you are listening to music, which is basically the way you listen to a song, 
from 19, uh, I don't know, uh, important song from the 60s or 70s, I prefer to listen to it uh, on vinyl uh, because I will finally have the full feeling of it. Uh, like it was instead now, the music that we are uh, uh, pushed, it's all kind of bad quality, aside from itself being simply the remake of the remake of the remake in which you have a sample of a song from 30 years ago, probably used already 10 times and they, with the, and on top they use another rap or another line or they do a cover song because the ideas are not there anymore. There is a big problem also with art. Art doesn't have any more new ideas. It's, it's, not, it's been so much uh, controlled, manipulated, the way the artists have been manipulated that doesn't bring anything naturally. Uh, you don't have any new revolutionary music genres coming up because simply the, the, there is a, a standardization and there is a record labels that these days don't work like before. They don't invest any more money on the artists. They simply pick them up from the internet. Okay, this guy does a million visualization. Let's sign him up. And that's how it works today. And, and, and there is no more musicians who literally uh, work their asses off to arrive to success. They go maybe to a talent show in which, uh, you know, ah, they get chosen by a panel of so-called between brackets experts, you know. So this is uh, unfortunately uh, the way uh, we are going uh, uh, with, uh, with with music and with everything else. But uh, then I also, and to, with this, of course, I, clo uh, I think we are closing the interview, but uh, it's important, we said before we close the interview, there is also a part of my book dedicated to the way that artificial intelligence is now being used to make money, right. to make even films, to uh, create artificial uh, uh, characters based on the original ones. Like, for example, now uh, in the next hundred years, we will still be watching Robert De Niro or other actors simply because they have borrowed their face to the artificial intelligence that will oh, use God. them in the context of new films. And, and the problem that we see with the, with the new film directors, but also with the people who write the new scripts for movies, is that they are relying more and more on, on things like chat GPT, something like the open AI intelligence that basically can write you a script of a movie in, in, 10, in 10 seconds, in 10 minutes, I don't know. In, and then you are, you are basically becoming more and more lazy. The artificial intelligence is taking over. And another topic which I add to this one in the book is, of course, uh, uh, metaverse, because the metaverse is another reality which Hollywood is experimenting with, and also big artists like Snoop Doggy Dog. I mean, somebody paid, I think, $500,000 to have his villa next to Snoop Doggy Dog in the metaverse. Who cares? The metaverse <laughs> doesn't exist. But that's, that's the way. They're, con they're not conscious. I mean, I, I talk about the transhumanism, you know, again, not anything different or nothing that you don't know, but the transhumanists are basically under the AI influence. They're almost Borg. They're hive minded. They have no spiritual connection. They're completely disconnected from spirit, from spirit. And so for them, they're lazy. They're disorganized. They have no interest in connecting to spirit. They don't want to work. They don't want to go within to connect the spirit. They want to literally just have an easy life, Leo. So those people will be chipped and they will put the neural link in their head and they will be uploaded to the cloud of the metaverse and people like you and I, and obviously people that listen to us will be sovereign, empowered and free. And like you said, in part seven, and also in this book, you know, we're going to be living in probably like almost like mountainous communities off grid. We won't even have technology. We'll go back to the ways of the old. We might even become telepathic. Who knows? We'll develop skills that we didn't have for so long. Well, the, the problem is that probably uh, I think that the, the first people who will become telepathic will be the ones who will have a brain computer interface uh, not because they will be. <laughs> I don't be, know about that. I don't because know. Because they, they seem to, 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 to uh, they will be probably all connected to this. Control. 
they'll definitely be remote control, but I don't think they'll be telepathic. But I think, I think. The well, it is, you see, the, the thing is that uh, we see also when it comes down to, uh, to the future, a scenario in which probably we will communicate less and less. Uh, and that's why we will uh, probably, if we have a computer brain inter interface that makes us send immediately inputs and messages into your brain, that is telepathy in a way, no? Okay. Uh, but it's not, of course, natural. It's all controlled by the grid. Now, the smart cities are part of this uh, problem. And so avoiding the smart cities, avoiding the smart cars, avoiding, like I said, in volume seven, the smartphones and everything else, because they're all part of a grid that wants to control us. Uh, going back to the show business, I mean, and, and films in particular, I mean, uh, I don't really like films like uh, The Way of Avatar, The Way of Water. I find it like, it's not nothing there. It's all kind of computer generated AI imagery, left, right, and center. And, 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 and this is the way, well, I mean, it's, it, this is not art for me. It's simply implementing additional uh, brainwashing that can manipulate in one way or another your brain. And let's not forget that all this is done for a purpose. So before we end up with this transmission, the purpose has to be reminded. This is made to prepare and pave the way to the Antichrist, who will rise aided and abated by the AI. So the yeah. transhumanists, like you said, you have a completely, you're completely correct in what you say. Transhumanism, the AI, the millennials are already leading towards transhumanism naturally. They seem to be naturally inclined in accepting it, like, okay, a way of life. And then we, from our generations, from our generation, we, we will have to teach uh, the younger people who are willing to get off this grid because they are very much more con controlled than us. Our generations, uh, I don't know how old you are, but I'm 53 and I'm 53 on the 5th of March. We are more or less the same generation. Yeah, Our generation uh, lived in contact with a different reality. But the new generations, uh, I don't know how much they will uh, be able of uh, becoming aware if they don't grow up separately. That's why we have to build this, these uh, small micro communities that also provide education out of the grid, out of the system. Because otherwise, it's, uh, young people will simply be, they're already brainwashed. They're already linked to their smartphone 24 hours a day like this, you know? Yep. So exactly. Uh, no, they are. You're totally right. Yeah, so like you said, I mean, you know, we all have to take make choices uh, on our own individually, and obviously connect. You know, obviously be connected to our source, to spirit, to God, and from that, then allow. You know, from a surrendered aspect, just allow God to lead us. But you're right. So many people have no connection to spirit anymore because these. Yeah, yeah. and and it's like nowadays they are still an external something external, but gradually they will put them internal. You know, the phone is something external now, but it's going to become internal in a very short time. I mean, every single company in Silicon Valley is working on transhumanist interactions within uh, the next 10 years. We will have something inside our body. And I'm not sure it's going to be the computer brain interface of Elon Musk, but the, the, I'm pretty sure that from 2025 onwards, they will start microchipping large parts of the population, starting in Europe already now, and in 2024-25, developing even more this problem, until at one point, uh, you know, we will have to face a decision. And, and it's the microchipping, the first stage of uh, this whole uh, digital prison that is constructed around us yeah. and that we have to avoid. So thank you so much for, for having me on and for discussing these interesting subjects with you as usual. It's always a great chat, Jay. <laughs> uh, definitely, Leo. I appreciate you. Love you. Amazing. Thank you for your work. Thank you for all of you guys out there that are not familiar with Leo. And again, very few of you are not or aren't already. But uh, if you're not, go to his website, leozagami.com. Uh, of course, you can pick up his book on Amazon. His paperback is 700 pages. It's profound. 
Uh, I would definitely tell you to read the chapter seven too. You know, I mean, I mean, if you go on the Kindle, it's even a thousand pages. The thing is that <laughs> I suggest people to get the Kindle if they want simply for commodity. If they want no, to, man, read you gotta have a paperback. No, no, no. But I'm saying for commodity, if you want it, but always buy together with the paperback. Yeah, because they can't burn that in your house. No, but also they can't edit it from a distance because right. what they're gonna be doing soon is right. editing your books without you knowing and really? so order it really? as much as possible in this version which you have now because we don't know if in six months a year two years they're gonna allow the same version out exactly unfortunately that You're exactly right fair. they're bur- it's it's like they're burning the digital alexander library of alexandria well, they are rewriting the books of James Bond saying they're racist and masculine. <laughs> Come on, man. That's it. No? So it's... Uh, Unbelievable, they're, man. They're going towards uh, actually censoring the great classics of literature with warnings on top. Uh, even, even then branding people who read the George Orwell's 1984 as white extremists. So yes. this is the scenario that we have. Yes, but we will, of course, provide you until we can with some uh, information here using uh, the web until it's possible. Then at one point, I don't know if we're going to have to use an alternative form of web, if we're going to have to go into the deep web, if we're going to have to uh, maybe meet in person and do like in the old days, conference rooms uh, with the real people no longer the virtual uh, sessions on the internet. That's that's what I think, Leo, 100%. All right, guys and gals, you guys saw a profound show here today. Uh, please support the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell podcast. Go to leozagami.com, purchase this book on Amazon, and of course, remember, mm-hmm. raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys. You see, you see here, you have everybody watching the screen, yep. hypnotized with the film in time. But then there is one guy who is not hypnotized and he's watching somewhere else, and it's me. That's awesome. <laughs> because uh, we don't have to be hypnotized by the system. We have to turn the other way when that happens. Thank you so That's much. Awesome, Thank you, Leo. I appreciate it. Okay, guys, we'll see you guys all soon.